big part of the Engine Performance Expo are some live editions of the hit podcast, Hidden Horsepower, presented by Total Seal Piston Rings. And we have got a great guest right now, Ooh, Lake right. Brian Tooley of Brian Tooley Racing. Mm -hmm. An amazing career in, let's call it, uh, you know, airflow and yes. uh, yeah. getting the power to those cylinders. Welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. Uh, great to be here. So before we got started, just some rapid fire history of Brian's career and uh, instant inspiration, Lake. Absolutely. So you have a very interesting <laughs> yeah. path where it's kind of wound back and forth. So yeah. you started off doing cylinder head and air, airflow 40, stuff. 40 cylinder heads, yeah. Bought a flow bench in 93 when I lost my job as a maintenance mechanic. I was 29 years old and had never been in another cylinder head porty shop. Didn't know anyone who ported heads, but I'd been doing it you know, as a hobbyist yeah, for years. And so bought... So I bought a flow bench and started a business. It was actually hired into Holly Park Development for a few years in the 90s. Okay. And uh, helped develop some different stuff there. I'm the reason Holly made cylinder heads in the 90s, by the way. Really? Yeah. And then, um, you know, went back into uh, self-employment. Total Engine Airflow was the business name. Mm -hmm. can, we, can we pause right there just because <laughs> at the end of our Hidden Horsepower episodes, we always ask for advice for the next generation. And hopefully right. uh, people, young people, people who are aspiring We'll watch this and, and be inspired to do what they want to do. You were a mechanic. You lost your job. Maintenance mechanic. Maintenance in a mechanic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so explain what the, rapidly the daily grind of that was. You weren't as happy as you are now. What well, were you doing? Well, my background was actually electronics. I worked in missile control center on a ballistic missile submarine. So computers and electronics was my passion. But then when I got out, I got the opportunity to become a multi craft maintenance mechanic at a factory. Because they were like, hey, we'll teach you how to, you know, TIG weld, and stick weld, and MIG weld, and run mills and lace. And I was like, this sounds cool, you know. So I took that job, and learned all those skills, and then, you know, and which all of which helped, you know, later on in life, you know. So, but if I had to give anyone advice, I think for you know uh, what to do, work ethic, work yeah. hard, and bring the work ethic. If you don't have super strong work ethic, don't don't even try to be self-employed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Don't step across that line. Yeah, yeah just go work for somebody else. Well, taking and right. taking a chance, like you bet on yourself. You you mm. invested in a piece of equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bought the flow bench and and uh, you know met Rick Smith in 1996. Uh, that's the founder of Trick Flow. Okay. Uh, so Rick started Trick Flow in the 80s. Uh, sold it to Summit Racing in '93, and he tried to hire me in '96, and um, they didn't hire me because I didn't have CNC experience, and then. Rick left around 1999, and then you know the, the manager of Trickfall always kept uh, tabs on me, and uh, so uh, you know we 2001 we bought a five-axis simultaneous CNC machine, uh, Bob Hudson set up, mm -hmm. and uh, that went real well. I was sporting heads for Tony Bischoff, who I know was on this show, and yep. uh, back then and Proline Racing and all kinds of people, Texas Speed, mm -hmm. and uh, so um, you know. Summit Racing uh, certainly got their attention, Trick Flow, and uh, they were behind the game. So in, in 2004, when I sold Total Engineer, Total Engineer Flow to Summit Trick Flow, they were the only domestic cylinder head manufacturer in the U.S. who did not CNC port their own cylinder heads. The only one. Wow. They were last to market for CNC cylinder head porting. So yeah. they didn't hire you because you didn't have CNC experience. <laughs> Then you end up, buy, they bought you because, because of your CNC experience. It, it, yes, okay. Ex expertise. <laughs> well, that's a valuable lesson right there. The ability to evolve, change, acquire new knowledge, learn new things. Well, that's the second part of this, yeah. right? You got to have work ethic and you have to continue to learn. You yeah. never, you, you always keep learning. And a little bit of grace and God, you know, grace of God oh, uh, thrown in there. <laughs> it goes oh, a whole lot of that. <laughs> Catching a break here and there. It yeah. never hurts. Me meeting Bob Hudgens. Uh, you know, that's an interesting story that I'll probably save for after this uh, segment. But, okay. uh, you know, meeting him in Florida at his facility mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, him showing me Camplete Port. That was in 2000. He just developed Camplete Port. And he said, you know, hey, this this takes CNC porting from about, you know, from digitized data to uh, toolpath, it takes it from about 40 hours down to about eight. Wow. Which was in 2000, 2001, that was uh, revolutionary, right? And, and, of course, the really cool thing was you didn't have to know a whole lot about, you know, uh, CAD CAM, et cetera, et cetera, because the 
program was simple enough that you could go from digitized data, create a surface, create a toolpath, and, and port ahead. So I bought a 5-axis CNC and had never turned a CNC on. And within weeks, we were porting heads. Because of that? Because of that. And so, it, but, but back then, that was a big deal because, you know, 2000, 2001, no one could sell you a turnkey porting yeah, time package. Time because I think that's, this is a big deal because I think mm -hmm. that's, I've heard it from several people that making that jump to CNC seems mm -hmm. like it's like a foreign language. It's a, it's a, you know, river yeah. too wide to cross. Yeah. Because, oh my God, I don't know. It seems like tool pass. Yeah, I can have a, a ferro arm. I can get digital data that this is what it is. Mm -hmm. But how do I turn that into a tool path? I'm not fluent in CAD CAM. I'm not a master CAM guru. Right. How do I make this thing work yep. so that I get what I want? Mm-hmm. And you're saying that there's things that bridge that gap. Yeah, complete port. Who eventually sold to Mastercam? Okay. So if you use Mastercam today, you're using complete port technology from 20 some years ago, which is interesting to me. You know. So it, it's not as maybe daunting as people might think it is making that change. Right. Yeah. The thing about all of us men is we all put our pants on one leg at a time, and if another man can figure it out, then you can probably figure it out too. Right. Ooh, there's a line from this one already. <laughs> Every year there's a line, right? I'm wearing the t-shirt under this that was, you know, WJ from the first year, which is, you can't tune it up if you blew it up. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah it was good Don't, don't so. blow it up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's, what, what about these days, obviously? You've, yeah. Uh, the, the, the technology that we're working with has evolved. The it engines has. have evolved, yep. and you have kept on the cutting edge with uh, many, uh, much of what's out there. Well, I, you know, I'm all about bang for the buck when it comes to horsepower, mm -hmm. right? And and you know, in the early 2000s, when I could pour a pair of LS heads and pick up 50 horsepower, that was good bang for the buck. Well, by the time I sold uh, TEA to Summit Racing 2004, 2005, LS3 heads came out, LS7 heads came out. So the factory stuff just got better and better. And I felt like that was coming when I saw my first LS head in 1997, because I was just like, whoa, Ooh. this thing's serious, right? And so, you know, selling, uh, you know, selling the business made sense to me because I was just like, you know, the, the gain from porting heads is just getting smaller and smaller. Well, I think the thing that happened at that same time was the gains from camshafts got bigger and bigger because the heads got better and better, you know. Right. And so, you know, somebody was just asking me about our new Godzilla cam that we're launching. Uh, Slide the stock cam out, slide this cam in, don't even change valve springs. It's 100, 120 horsepower. Unreal. It's what? unbelievable, you know, and, you know, and it's all, you know, but look at the cylinder head. You know, the cylinder head looks like a Gen 5 Chevy head, canted valve. It looks like a NASCAR head from right. just 10 years ago. It's, well, I think back to Project Pontiac, that's a perfect example you were mentioning. Back in the day when you were racing with your dad and you're running, all you had was the factory head. That's it. And so yeah. that was your limitation. So, of course, mm -hmm. yeah. The, the guys back in the day, the Keith Wilsons and all those kind of guys, they became famous. Why? Because they had to work on the heads. Everyone was mm -hmm. messing with heads and porting yeah. and grinding and the trick of the head, yeah. you know, type deal. But then CNC came along and just basically blew that out of the water. Made it much easier, for sure. Yeah, because you could do a really killer port one time and duplicate it thousands of times. and. And the factory uh, heads started catching up to that. The factory heads started catching up, absolutely. Like I said, it's that, that, that NASCAR background that you know, GM learned from being in NASCAR. Absolutely. And the LS heads look a whole mm -hmm. lot like, <laughs> you know, R07 type head. Yeah, yep, exactly. And so, you know, so quit Summit Racing, Trick Flow in 2010. My wife was, uh, you know, homesick, wanted to move closer to home. Okay. So moved back to Kentucky, and I had two-year non-compete, and I... I uh, got my real estate license and did some day trading and stupid stuff, and I was still building engines, important heads, and uh, uh, TrickFlow actually changed spring vendors, and I saw an opportunity to sell um, the springs that we had developed, mm -hmm. you know, five, six years earlier. We, we sold uh, a, a spring for five years without a single failure, and um, and when they changed spring vendors, um, they they lost 50,000 to cold mine height, so I was just like, okay, this is not going to end well, no. right? No, so, no. So, uh, you know, I called that spring vendor and, and uh, you know, and got set up and started selling valve springs out of my basement. And, uh, it, you know, it's really funny because people were like, well, what was your goal when you started this business? I'm like, my goal was to, to not have to go get a real job. 
you know, that was my goal. <laughs> you know, I was trying to make $50,000 a year net profit out of my basement. And, uh, and so, but that we quickly exceeded that. And yeah. so it's it, interesting. I just moved out of the basement 10 years ago this month. Really? 10 years ago this month. I've been to your place. It's nice. <laughs> yeah. but it, it's much bigger now. It's three times the size. Three times the size. It, it's because uh, it was wow. 15,000 square feet when you were there. It's 45,000 yeah. now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we, that's Springs. What, well, you, yeah. you yeah. got going on. Who are yeah. your customers? Who's your target client? Who's coming yeah. to you for your high performance knowledge and parts? So, you know, really anyone with a, the 97 newer Corvette, 98 newer Camaro, 99 newer truck, mm -hmm. you know, CTSV, anything with a LS, LT, which is lots of vehicles, right? Um, you know, street strip guys, guys that daily drive their trucks. Uh, you know, I, I daily drive a, a Ram T Rex, for example, and mm -hmm. you don't know if that is. That's a, a truck with a. Hellcat okay. engine in it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, just a phenomenal it, truck. Incredible. I can't believe they even make it, you know. <laughs> so as, as some of this production factory stuff's gotten more powerful and more powerful, guys want to step up their older vehicles for power. Mm -hmm. And so they're putting superchargers and cam kits and ported heads and all that stuff. So really, it's anyone from the, you know, the guy that's just daily driving his truck all the way up to some of these class racers. We don't we don't really focus a lot on class racing, you know. Um, I believe that's Tony Bischoff and those guys, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so we we like just supplying parts to the to the masses. Um, so um, you know the guys that you know obviously we've done Chevy LSLT for a long time. We just launched our Hemi cams a few months ago. Uh, launching the Godzilla cam now. So all this late model push rod performance is is what we're all about. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's the backbone of the industry. Let's face it. Like you yeah. mentioned, class racing within the NHRA is something that I love, mm -hmm. but very specialized mm -hmm. just to be able to be there and, and very expensive. This, call it a culture, a hobby, whatever we want to call it, yeah. the backbone is the person that wants to put a cam in their car to feel a little more power. As simple as that, and you make it easy. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to have well-engineered products that work together. A guy can just go home. He doesn't even have to have a height mic to set the spring kit up. You know, he can just bolt the parts in, and it just works and runs and, and lasts. Because you know. you've done all the work for him on that side. Yeah. Exactly, you, yeah. You've done the Spintron work and this and that, so it's, it's a system, mm -hmm. not different parts. Yes, yeah, exactly. You know, we brought uh, cam development in-house in 2018 with mm -hmm. the uh, Spintron, and, you know, fortunately through people like Billy Godbold who, you know, um, got to spend some time with him and mm -hmm. uh, you know we bought the same software that comp use and uh you know so that started our path to lobe development and then brought cam grinding in-house um last year and so uh, it's been a really interesting path you know I've, we've we've become in a position i thought i would never ever in my life uh, be in <laughs> you know it's really hard to believe but uh, we're manufacturing all of our cast aluminum products in-house all of our intake manifolds all of our valve covers um you know, we're we're coming to mark with our own sonar head, of course, because right. my, you know, my yeah, right. yeah, 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 it's natural uh, thing. And uh, you're doing engines now too, right? Building engines. Yeah, we have two Swiss turn machines, uh, spin out retainers, and um, we do powder coating in house, and uh, you know, the cam polishing. You know, the isotropic uh, okay, awesome. polishing. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and you know, and it's funny because, you know, I was talking to Billy right before I came in here, and you know. You know, I'm really riding on the coattails of all the pioneers, right? Right. Because, you know, Billy pioneered the, the isotropic uh, rim finishing yep. for the camshafts that they call MSC. Yep. You know, so when that when that vendor contacted us, said, would you like to buy this equipment? I said, yes, yes. I would. Yes. Yeah, that's, <laughs> sure. Yeah, it sounds great. You know, yeah. so, so, you know, that can't be understated. You know, if you're in the position to watch uh, mistakes happen, you know, because sometimes right. you see vendors... Uh, make mistakes what you feel like are mistakes and if you can observe those mistakes and say you know i think i would do this differently this way uh, which is ironically what billy and i was just talking about mm -hmm. and so we do things differently with the way we do cam cores and right. the heat treat and and all that sort of stuff uh, but it's really interesting to be able to you know get the best cam cores the best heat treat the best cam grinding the best cam finishing uh, you know, develop the best cam lobes. It's really quite unbelievable. If somebody had told me five years ago you would have the best of all of this stuff, I'd be like, "There's, there's no way. You can't get from here to there in five years. It's impossible." You know, but, but here we are. But you did it. 
Well, I want to talk about LT stuff for a minute because I think that's a super interesting platform, right? Love LT. No, nothing against the LS crowd or the Hemi's yeah. or anything else, <laughs> right. but let's talk about LT direct injection engines. Uh, I'm going to think back here. This has probably been six mm -hmm. years or so ago. Me and Ben Strader mm -hmm. bought one of them okay. to do some work. We were working with uh, Oak Ridge. By the way, if you don't know, we're in Piney Flats, Tennessee. That's East Tennessee. Yep. So mm -hmm. we're about an hour and a half-ish from Oak Ridge, which is where they did the uranium development part of the Manhattan Project. So anyone mm -hmm. who watched Oppenheimer uh, this past summer, well, guess what? Oak Ridge is part of the Manhattan Project. It's still one of the largest government research labs. There's over a thousand PhD scientists mm -hmm. at Oak Ridge National Lab. So we were doing some work with them Mm -hmm. uh, when I was still at Driven, at Driven, yes, uh, I remember with direct injection because they also have the National Transportation Research Lab is mm -hmm. at Oak Ridge, and so they were looking at abnormal combustion with direct injections. So we bought one of these engines, and wow, for an out of the box factory engine, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. bang for your buck. Yeah. Talk to me about it. I mean, I, so. GPI, we, you know, we sell spring kits to GPI, Guatney Performance Innovations, and they called me one day and said, we just made 740, 750 horsepower with our stock short block LT1. And at that time, I was just like, that's like two horsepower per cubic inch, hydraulic roller, pump gas, stock rockers. I'm like, man, that sounds like a lot, right? And so, you know, I bought a 2019 Camaro, and we pulled the engine out, we put it on the engine dyno, and and we actually bought a set of their CID heads, and uh, we were doing our camshaft development. Of course, we bought everyone else's camshafts, and um, you know, and we we get to working on this thing, and we ended up at 740 horsepower, naturally aspirated pump, 85, 230 intake duration camshaft. Uh, it's just unbelievable. And and when and we had our Trinity intake on it, which is a port injected intake, but we okay. we had the injectors in it, but they weren't operational, right? Because we're running on the DI. Okay. And so we uh, we took the intake off, we took the direct injectors out, we plugged the holes, we put our intake back on and turned on the port injectors, and that engine lost 60 horsepower. Whoa. It lost 60 going to port? Yes, sir. Whoa. And so I, as soon as I saw that, because I'm a big latent heat of evaporation guy, mm -hmm. right? And I'm like, it didn't do what I expected. Right. And so I said, okay, that has to be an airflow thing. What, what was the difference in airflow? And the difference in airflow was 8%. Because It lost fuel. 8% putting the fuel in the port, clogging the port up. And then we did the same thing on M1. Uh -huh. The engine made 785 horsepower on M1. When we switched to port, it made 700. Yeah. 85 horsepower difference. Yeah. Between port Bigger and Bigger difference with methanol because you put more fuel through it. Right. All right, so that goes back. So the, last year at the Engine Performance Expo, we had a video with Ron Shaver hmm. and talking about the evolution of mechanical fuel injection. So we're going way back, right? The old school, yeah. constant flow injection. You know, Dan Gurney is like literally the most underrated guy ever. Gurney was the guy that came up with the idea of aiming the injector at the back of the valve, as opposed to having the big one mm -hmm. just trying to atomize the fuel, yeah. clogging up the port. Clogging up the port, yeah. He's like, just spray it at a, yeah. at a stream at the back of the valve and let the valve yeah. you know, scatter it out and atomize mm -hmm. it. And it was all about that volume. You got all this air you're trying to push through the port. Yeah. If you have a bunch of fuel in the way, every fuel molecule is displacing an air molecule. And engines have to have both and the yeah, limit is did. the air. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. And the the airflow difference on the M one was twelve percent. Twelve percent. Twelve percent. Yeah. That's how much more the M one clogged up the port. Yeah. So so very, very interesting. You know, and people say, Oh, that's all BS. You know, there's some tuners out there that are just like, Well, you're tuning this bunk and, and at one point we ran the engine on like twenty five percent DI, seventy five percent port, fifty fifty, then seventy five, twenty five the other way. And the math exactly carried through the whole time. Every time you went to more DI, you had more airflow. You made more power. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so, so yeah. I think it's just. I think it's the best push rod engine ever made. I'm a. I'm a horsepower cubic inch guy. I'm an efficiency guy. Yeah. And, and in terms of that, you know, I, I remember 20 years ago when we were working pretty hard to make two horsepower cubic inch out of race engines. Right. And to have a stock short block. 
fly cut just the intake side of the piston, right? That's mm -hmm. a stock short block. Fly cut the intake side of the piston, didn't you take the piston side of the block? You know, after market heads, you know, a, a streetable cam mm -hmm. intake and, and that kind of power, just unbelievable. Never thought I'd see the day, ever. You know, that's so awesome. Very cool, a very cool time to be a gearhead, for sure. So how challenging is it to try to run it and set it up to run on both DI and port? Obviously, you need to run it on port, I mean, DI, but what's that like trying to use the computer system and all that? Well, I've got uh, really smart guys that work for me. So James Short is our calibration engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, because of the Gen 5 engine is the reason we hired James Short. Okay. Because it was kicking our butt. You know, we weren't trying uh, it. Yeah. We, we weren't tuners. And, you know, and I mean, you, when it was just air fuel ratio spark, we could muddle our way through it. We were trying to run a, a factory computer. So now you have to program the torque tables. Right. And so it, the, the sophistication of the tuning is far more with the, the direct injected engine, unfortunately. And so, uh, so we actually hired him. And so, you know, he's a whiz at, Electronics, computers, tuning, all that stuff, and he's just like, "Oh yeah, just just do this," and you know, made it look easy. So, so that was easy. We sell a kit, you know, to add on port injection to direct injected uh, engine. Okay. Yeah, and as others do too. Yeah. Sure, sure. So sure. it's not not too bad. So then people are also going beyond just the NA version; they're putting superchargers on them. Absolutely. Yeah. That, how, how much change do you have to make for that? Well, it's not uh, it's not a lot. I mean, obviously, you have to have the fuel, you know, so um, a lot of different ways to get more fuel to it. Is that typically adding the port on top of it? Because I, I yeah. know that's one of the mm -hmm. limitations with DI is you typically run out of injector. Absolutely. Yeah, and by 785 horsepower, we were, com on M1, we were completely out of fuel. Yeah. We had LT4 pump, LT4 injectors, 100 PSI on the on the low side, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and I, I think our fuel pressure was 3,500 PSI at the mm -hmm. rail right. and still wasn't still wasn't enough. So yeah, so you run out of fuel uh, pretty quickly with boosted applications and you definitely need the port, uh, you know, the port injection on top of that you know, to make the power. Make it, okay, yeah. yeah, but guys will tell you, guys that have tuned these LS, LS, LS3, LS7 boosted applications forever, they'll do the same basic blower boost level on a, on a DI engine and it's 100 horsepower more to the tires. Oh yeah. wow! Okay, and they'll, they'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'd I'd bought a in 2018. I'd bought a 2019 ZR1, which was direct injected and port injected. Yes. From the factory. Right. Right. So that was kind of a cool cool engine. We eventually made 1,100 of the tires with it. Okay, I was about to say. So where 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 are the numbers that people are getting out of these DI engines now? Yeah, yeah I mean. I, there's no telling on the high side. I, I couldn't even tell you where the high side is at this point. Uh, and, a lot, and a lot of the guys that are setting records with those engines right now, unfortunately, are 100% port because uh, yeah. they're running aftermarket ECUs and the ECU doesn't support the direct ejection, which is a shame because you're leaving power on the table, table. Yeah. for sure. Um, but um, but yeah, what a what a wonderful engine. It's pretty neat. So on on that note, uh, I like to think we need to seed the fields of the future. And when the LS came out, there was that whole wave of everybody going to the junkyards and just junkyard LS, right? Mm -hmm. Get a turbocharger, throw it on, you're making 800 horsepower for a while. Yep. Um, if you were going to recommend a platform for this next wave of people that are going to do something with, with a, a, an engine yep. and have a little fun, yep. maybe they haven't done anything. They don't have anything. What's the platform that they should go hunt for? In my opinion, the 2014 and present 5.3 L83 that's in all the trucks. Okay. Because you look at all the five threes that's in every vehicle imaginable now, every one of those came out of a 99 to 13 truck, right? The 2014 to present trucks with the five threes, that is such a disregarded engine because people are scared of direct injection, but it takes the same low side fuel system to power a direct injected vehicle engine as it does a port injected engine. It's exactly the same fuel system, okay. right? Because all the high pressure fuel system is in the engine. You don't right. have to worry about it, right? And so like a, a Gen 4 5.3 mm -hmm. with aftermarket trick flow heads, big 233 intake uh, duration camshaft on our dyno, uh, that engine was you know 500 horsepower or something, right? Very mm -hmm. low. And um, our L83, with just a 220 intake duration cam, factory ported heads, uh, that engine made 569 horsepower. Okay. Now to put that in perspective, an LS3 with a stage four cam, that same 233 duration cam, it makes 570 on our dyno, right? So you're making LS3 6.2 liter power 
out of this direct ejected 5.3. And it makes very good torque because of the DI, uh, the DI and the fact you're using such a small cam and we're using VVT. Oh, yeah. So we have eight degrees total advance in this cam mm -hmm. and then retard it, you know, right. as the RPMs come up. You know, so you're getting a low end torque mm -hmm. with all that advance. You're getting talking horsepower. It's just a great package and it is the most slept on, uh, you know, great little engine out there. I think they have something to play with this year. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, exactly. That's uh, an engine performance exo expo project I've ever heard one. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, and and that's what it needs to be. It needs to be. I don't want to say simple or basic, but attainable mm -hmm. and obvious. You mm -hmm. you know, not everybody can just open up the the Summit catalog and order everything, or or go directly to you and, and get a high performance engine. They've they've got to start off with something. And there's there's fun factor too. Oh, the yeah. idea that you pulled something out of a truck in a junkyard and put it into your vehicle mm -hmm. and now it's uh, it's your creation, that, that I think is the, the core of this whole hobby. And so that's the next wave, perhaps. Yeah, and, and what we want to do is we want to offer a computer uh, harness package, camshaft package. You just buy the camshaft package, the computer wiring harness, bolt it on engine, bolt it in a car, it's tuned, it works, it runs, it makes power. That's what we want to do. One That's of the next cool. steps. Yeah, I think simplicity is also a big factor in the modern era. Awesome, yeah. They want to, <laughs> they want to do it, yeah. and they want it to work. Right, because yeah. when you get down to it, the the, le the level of tuning is so complex compared to what it used to be. You know, it's very complex. Like it's said, way more than just fuel air spark. It, it, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and so when you simplify that by having it pre-tuned for the customer. That greatly uh, makes things easier for them, because we, you know, uh, customers don't always know everything they need to know, right? We've had customers in Nebraska buy a cam kit and then call us up and say, "You mean I, to tell me I have to tune this thing?" And it's just like, "Yeah, you just assume that they know that," and then um, and they're like, "Well, the closest tuning shop is four hours from me." You know, that's an all-day trip just to go get this thing tuned, and you're right. just. You know, yeah. so um, so anyway, we hope to do a package like that. Okay. So talk about Godzilla for a minute. I want yeah. before we get out of time, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Godzilla. Right? Yeah. Four guys out there need some love too, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, I love the Godzilla. Love the big bore, big displacement. Uh, you know, and I got to tell you a story. Two years ago, we we're at PRI, mm -hmm. and the, the whole weekend, people had come to us Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Are you making Godzilla parts? You making Godzilla intake? You making? No, no, we're not making. We're not making. We don't have time. You know, we're not making. The last hour of the last day on Saturday, Brian Wolf comes to the booth, and I know who he was, and he said, will you make me a Godzilla intake? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir, we will. <laughs> the right person. <laughs> so, you know, so then that kind of opened the door to doing the camshaft stuff. You know, mm -hmm. he, uh, you know he, he saw what we had going on, and so, um, you know, so we did some camshaft stuff for him, and it was better than what he was getting uh, from another place. And uh, so... You know, now we that that camshaft. I mean, two twenty-two intake duration, over a hundred horsepower, and you don't even have to change the stock springs. It's just, That's huge, right there. It's unbelievable, yeah. right? I mean, unbelievable. Just slide one out, mm -hmm. slide the other one in, and off you go. Yeah, yep. And uh, that L eight T, you know, direct ejected engine, mm -hmm. it's really not far behind. We're doing a build-up series with Power Auto Media right now, and. Uh, and going just from the stock cam in it to our stage two cam, it's only 210 intake duration. I mean, we're already at 50 horsepower gain. Uh, you know, and that's a and that's a low lift cam. It's under 550 lift. You know, so you know, very you know, something you could drive for a long time and not have problems. Right. With. Yeah, that's key. Yeah, because you know the the stock cams are that much lift. Uh, the LT1, the L86, all those. So. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, what a what a time to be alive. But yeah, the Ford guys. So we had the Godzilla intake. Uh, now we're coming out with a Ford intake, longer runner. Okay. Uh, for the truck guys, that's going to be a bolt-on truck intake. Really excited about that. You know, because it's going to have the torque that the truck oh. guys need. All right. You know. All right. Before we run out of time, mm -hmm. we we got our advice for the next generation out of the way at the beginning, which I think is great. You got to have mm -hmm. a work ethic. But uh, we are, we're trying to inspire the next generation to get in and involved. And there's a lot of folks with machine shops and, and, mm -hmm. and high performance uh, shops that are, you know, I don't want to call it, say, aging out, but they're wondering, like, where, where is the, mm -hmm. the group coming behind? So uh, talk directly to those people a little bit. And why is this industry something that, number one, I believe you said, kept you from having a real job? <laughs> right? <laughs> a real job, like, you yeah. know, working for the man or whatever. But right. uh, speak to those folks for a moment. Well, um, I guess that's a, a big question. Um, 
you know, there's so many smart guys out there. I've got a, uh, a very smart engineer that I hired from Holly last year, uh, electronics guy, but also is doing our, we, we just bought the same software that the OEs use for computer engine modeling. So we mm -hmm. had that software. He's running that. And, um, you know, he is just tickled to death because he wanted to do that his entire life, you know, do engine modeling on, on software. And so, so, you know, the technology out there is just unbelievable. And so I would I would encourage them to definitely embrace technology and 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 work hard at the technology software all of that because that is absolutely the future. You know, us car guys tend to be very mechanical guys. You know, we're swapping hard parts. You know, we now Spintron test and Dyno test our camshafts in the software, right? And then when that's done, we grind the hard parts and put them in the Spintron and Dyno and make sure it tells us what the software did. All right, it's a verification process, you know. So, you know, the, and adopting that technology and having young people who can, you know, uh, do the do all the the work that it takes to input all the variables into that software, um, you know, that's a daunting task. I mean, it's literally you know two months worth of work just to right. get all those uh, variables and inputs. Where can um, people find out more? Brian Tooley Racing. Check out all these parts and pieces and uh, information that we just talked about. Yes, sir. Yep. We have and yep. Um, awesome. We're on the website, and they can call in. We have eight sales guys uh, that answered phones all day, and they're great. Uh, and they're not in the basement. Not no, in the basement not anymore. Not in the basement anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not in the basement anymore. Yep. So, talking about Godzilla. Yeah. This next video is actually Ben Strader and myself talking about some manifolds for the Godzilla engine. What a day! What a day! What a day. Uh, yeah, my brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars. We are not.